This is the Sales Bible Podcast, episode 411, A Novel Approach for B2B Sales, an interview with Wayne Maloney. Welcome to Sales Babble, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non sellers. And now, your host, Pat Helmers. Hello, Sales Babblers. This is Pat Helmers. What's the best way to teach drama, politics, and egos that challenge the B2B sales? How about some fiction? In this episode, Wade Maloney shares a novel approach for teaching B2B sales. He does this by co-authoring an actual novel titled The Wentworth Prospect, a novel guide to B2B sales. In this drama, the book shares a tale of a very believable B2B enterprise sales challenge that's buffeted by the winds of fear, petty behavior, and courage. Wayne and I talk about the characters in the book, in the sales framework he calls Advance. Now, I know you're probably thinking, hey, Pat, last week you said we're going to be doing another Tao Te Ching of sales. I know I did say that. But I just finished this book. I was so excited about it that I really wanted to get Wayne on the podcast. Next week, we'll be back on schedule. So, with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Wayne. Are you ready to babble? I'm ready to babble, Pat. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Wayne, I just finished a book called The Wentworth Prospect. It's a novel guide to success in B2B sales. And that's a great play on words because it is literally a novel about selling. And you're one of the co-authors. I am. And I'm. Uh, it was a, a long time in the making, but we're really, really pleased with what we've delivered. And uh I I hope you are as well, mate, uh, having read it. I loved the book. I I couldn't put it down once I got started. I can't wait, and I am not teasing you. I can't wait to see this in a movie. (laughs) Yeah, we've we've had a few people say that. And, um, yeah, I'm just wondering who I could get to. uh, You know, I'd have to have a a cameo role in there somewhere, mate. I don't know who'd play me, but... (laughs) Well, you're a sales guy. You should be able to make that deal. Yeah, probably, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but, uh, why don't you tell me about this book? What motivated you and your co-authors, uh, Smibert and Clulo? Clulo, yeah. What motivated you guys to like do this? I, I've got a real strong belief that one of the things that we're missing in sales at the moment is uh, people getting a good grounding on the basics. I think there's too many people trying to jump jump ahead, look for the silver bullet that's going to help them win business without putting in all the effort and uh, and get an understanding of the basics. So I wrote two books, basically handbooks on sales management and sales, B2B sales foundations. Uh, but my passion in selling was always the top end, the complex strategic sales. And I always wanted to write a book on that. Um, colleague of mine, John Smybert, um, he and I had collaborated on a few projects. Uh, John had been building a, a sales process and methodology, which we use in the book called Advance. And uh, I'd been helping him on that. And I thought I'll approach John to write the book. And um, John said, yep, great idea. But he said, I've been thinking about uh, reading some other th- Why don't we have a look at writing it as a novel? And I'd read a few books in operation, some really good ones. Uh, The Goal by Eli Goldratt, which talks about lean manufacturing and lean process. And that was done. I I read it many, many years ago. Yeah, it's a fabulous book. It it sticks. You never forget it, do you? No, not at all. And and I'm a lean practitioner. Um, I've got a background in engineering where I started my career and I apply lean to everything I do in business and sales. So, yeah, we thought we'd have a go at it. and, and, And we had... A few false attempts um, at the four, four starts, and uh, we realised that you know we weren't very good novelists, but we were you know, still damn good sales consultants. And um, we engaged a couple of copyright of ghost writers; they didn't quite work with us. And a good friend of mine, John uh, Jeff Clulo, uh, he's a novelist, uh, ex advertising guy, good businessman, and uh, he was mentoring us. And in the end, he said, "Oh God," he said, "Just give it to me." <laughs> and, um, and and he he went away and he wrote 
a couple of chapters overnight, literally, and he sent them to us. And John and I, just on a Zoom call, we just looked at each other and, and we just went, oh, my God, this is it. And Jeff just got it. And um, he came on board. So he became our novelist. He was the guy that turned the vision that John and I had into the reality of the Wentworth Prospect. And over a period of probably 18 months working together on that, uh, we would work through with Jeff, go through how the, we thought the sale would work, and then he would turn it into uh, the novel that we got. And as we said, the novel guide to, uh, to B2B sales. And the reason I wanted to do it was if you think of a handbook or you think of your normal, let me use the word textbook, you know, those books that are out there that teach us how to sell. They may teach a methodology, they may teach a process as we've got with advance, but in a book like that, it becomes linear. You know, you do this step, you do this step, you do this step. And we all know that a sales process or any sales engagement in a complex sale is not linear. It moves all over the place. There are multiple people involved and each of those people will have a different agenda and it, not each of them will be on your side. So in writing a novel, what we were able to do, we were able to bring in the politics, the personalities and the potential pitfalls that someone would encounter going along and trying to close and de or develop and close a large complex sale, which Sue, our hero in the book, does. So that was the real, real key to that. And we also wanted to bring into, into play the you know, the different sorts of right and wrong, if you like, of, uh, of sales management, sales leadership. And the only way you could do that was in a novel or, as you say, in a movie. Um, just doing a book that just describes each of the steps in a sales process doesn't cut the mustard. The book, the story I could really relate to, you know, myself, my experience in selling technology, uh, being a part of the enterprise sale, you're like the ringmaster <laughs> balancing a lot of different people with a lot of different agendas who are all in the room. Um, this book really spoke to that. Yeah. And the ringmaster is a great, you know, it's a, it's a great uh, way of putting it, you know, the ringmaster, the conductor of an orchestra, but that's what you've got to do as a salesperson. You've got to bring together on your side and outside, but your organization but still on your side of the of the table all of the resources that are going to help the customer understand what the end result's going to be and how you're going to address all of the issues that they may face along the way and you've also got to i guess conduct or uh, control what's happening on the customer side of things because of the different personalities and the different the different archetypes that you're going to face within that organization um, because not everyone's going to want you to win the business um, you've got to understand what those people you know what the drivers are for each of the individuals so you know a salesperson in a complex sale is probably one of the most difficult but most interesting sales roles that you could uh, the you could most interesting yeah. yeah absolutely absolutely yeah and, and there's another thing here that you've not brought up, but I think is really important, is that some one of the most powerful ways of being successful in persuasion is not telling, but showing. Yeah. And, and when people can use a story to illustrate, it really resounds deeply with a person. That's yeah. what I think is powerful about this book is because you're telling a story, people can relate to it. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely spot on. Um, you know, you think back, you know, I still remember stories that I got told at school. You know, there'll be stories that were told by teachers. There'll be stories that will be told by friends and, and they resonate with you. And if you're told a story, you don't necessarily have to remember everything verbatim. You know, you can... You can listen to a story and you can massage that a little bit, but mm -hmm. still end up understanding and remembering the key points of that. And that's one of the critical things of storytelling. And, you know, storytelling goes back to 
well, back to the to the start of um, you know mankind, I guess. You know, oh, we're sitting we're, around the fireplace just sharing our experiences. Exactly. Yeah, and and that's the great thing about telling a story is people remember it. And you remember the key points that are most important to you. Now, I could sit down and I can tell you, you know, we spoke about the goal with Eli Goldratt. I can't necessarily remember each of the personalities in that as far as their names and that are concerned. But I could give you, you know, in a few minutes, I could give you an outline of what that story was about. I could tell you the key points uh, of the issues that were being raised as far as that lean principles of manufacturing that they were trying to implement. And I haven't read that book. You know, I've read it a couple of times, but I haven't read that now for, I don't know. 25 maybe, years. Well, you know, yeah, going back, <laughs> something like that, mate. Yeah. Um, but I can still remember that, and it still works with me. If I just sat down and read a book that told me, here's the steps of lean, I wouldn't necessarily be remembering them in the same way. No. No, you wouldn't be. And I think this is really important, especially in the context of a lot of the arguments that we have about politics in our world right now, and people are trying to like debate each other with facts and facts and facts, you yeah. know, and everybody argues on what's a fact and what's not a fact. Yeah. But you know, what's really powerful. If you say something wrong, it's like, well, you know, personally, this once happened to me or personally yeah. a friend, this happened to me and you just share it. People yep. can never argue with that because it happened. Yeah. You know, unless they're going to call you a liar. You just invented that story out of the blue. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, have, it's a slow sale. It, people are, may not walk away and agree with you, but it sticks in their head. And in a few months, it can turn It can turn people's opinions. Exactly. Exactly. And if you're, if you're working with a client and you've got good stories to tell, um, you know, you can, you, well, we talk about people, you know, I talk about people having a quiver of great stories. You know, they've got the different arrow that they'll fire at a different time. Um, you know, you can have stories about, about your company, you can have stories about your own success and failure and use at different times. I've got I've got a great story of one of the first encounters uh, in trying to sell a new product where I failed, and that that's that goes back nearly forty years and it sticks with me and it's a story that still works when I talk to people about it. Um, you know, so if you've got stories about the company, about success, about how other companies have overcome the sorts of problems that your clients have got. You're not there pushing a product. You're sitting there having a conversation and sharing thoughts and ideas with people, which actually improves the relationship. It improves the, uh, the communication. It builds confidence. And, you know, that term trusted advisor, which is thrown around a lot, and I don't like it, but it, but it, but it is correct in a lot of ways. It helps you build that level of trust in the relationship so that you can become trusted by the person that you're working with, the client or the prospect. Absolutely. So that people can get a, a more visceral understanding of the book. I did this with my wife and it really worked. What if you could do us a favor? Could you tell us the first chapter where Doug and Sue, with the first chapter that happens to Doug and Sue? Yeah. The, the, I guess what we tried to do with the book, and I'll just step back a little bit there, we, we tried to make it people understand everything that happened in that sales process. So in the first chapter, without giving a lot away, we sue yeah, actually yeah, moved. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, 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 I don't want you to give it away. I want people to, to, to hear the story and go, oh, yeah. i got to go read this. Yeah. Now, look, in the story, Sue's got a mentor. Um, and the mentor is, if you like, the white hat sales manager. He's the guy that really understands what it's all about to develop salespeople, not just push them to hit their numbers. You know, here's the end of the month, get out there, uh, you know, grab your brochures, sit there, talk about feature function benefit, close the deal. He's, a, he's someone that understands that to develop as a salesperson, you need to develop your domain expertise and he coaches Sue in how to do this. He coaches Sue to, um, to, to write articles that get published into uh, industry magazines, uh, to put up relevant posts on LinkedIn, uh, to build her profile to a level where she gets, in, gets invited into um, making presentations at industry seminars. And that's really where the book starts. And uh, she's made a, a presentation 
uh, in Western Australia, on the west coast of Australia. And uh, she's been very successful in doing that. She's made some great relationships. Uh, one of them uh, actually pays dividends because it comes out a little bit later in the story where there's a trigger event uh, with a major bank and she's able to leverage the relationship she made on that. It also shows how Doug, uh, her mentor, has closed uh, a very successful deal and he's done it in a manner which is not pushy. Uh, he's done it in a, <clears throat> excuse me, in a manner that allows that relationship of trust to build. And we build Doug in that, in that chapter into being the sort of sales manager that you need to be. And we believe um, that one of the weakest links in the revenue stream of any organization is sales management. Um, and one of the reasons is there's not a lot of development done there. So while in this book, we're treating the reader to the experience of Sue being successful in the sale, we're also showing by contrast, what's the difference between good and bad sales management. And in that way, hopefully helping sales managers develop as well. So the story goes on. Um, Sue does lose her mentor in that, uh, in that, and I won't go into how that happens. Um, and then she ends well, I would up. I would definitely explain how that happens. Sorry? <laughs> I would definitely explain how that happens because you got 50 more chapters to go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, he, his mentor, Doug, is killed in a car accident as they're returning from, uh, from that seminar that we spoke about. Uh, Sue wakes up in hospital and, um, yeah, that from there it builds that uh, she sees on, uh, on the TV in hospital that the person that she'd been speaking to in Perth is actually on there because his bank has just had a major uh, hacking event, which has cost them significantly. And that's really the start. That lays the foundation for, for where we go with the book. Uh, it lays the foundation for the trigger event to, for Sue to start to get in there, uh, how she develops the relationship with the person that we're talking about. We refer to him as an accomplice. Uh, he's not a change agent. He's not someone that's going to be uh, able to make decisions, but he's definitely someone that will help her through um, the, I guess, the, the the maze that she's going to discover in the bank. And it also then sets the scene for Doug to maintain that mentor status status through a uh, uh, through a manuscript that he's left her, guiding her on the process that she'll follow. It's so clever. Yeah, we so, thought it was so clever. Uh, thank you, thank you, Pat. I appreciate that, and uh, we've got Jeff to thank for that. He, as I said, he's the novelist in the group, and um, he just took what we said, you know, what we wanted to do, and he said, "Well, how about if we twist it this way or that way, and uh, you know, we make people want to turn to the next page." And uh, I think he's achieved that well. I think I think he's a he's a real talent. Jeff's a great writer. Yeah, yeah, just I'm, 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 I'm really, really, really impressed. One, one other thing, the thing that sticks the most in my mind, and I don't know how much we want to talk about this in the book, was the resistance that she had in her company and her, and her direct manager. It was extremely infuriating, and it was very relatable. <laughs> yeah, you know that's that's. That's one of the things that's come out. The number of people that have read this and come back and said, uh, and the guy's called Roper, and he's the guy. He's the guy that Doug Roper after yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony, right? To to Tony Roper, right? Tony Roper, yeah. And um, you know, he steps in after her uh, after a mentor's killed in the car accident. And the difference between the two, I mean, you know, he's probably a little bit over the top, um, but we really wanted to highlight the difference between that sales manager that is only interested in that number for the next quota. Get out there, close the business. Don't worry about what the customer really wants uh, or what he really needs. Just give them what they think they want and close the business, move on to the next one. And, you know, the number of people that have come back to us after reading the book and gone, oh, my God, Tony Roper, I used to work for that guy at XYZ. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and you know what? I hate to admit this, but when I was first promoted into a sales management role, uh, I think I was 23, and I've been a been a 
damn successful salesperson and I knew nothing about sales management um, and I got put into it and, and I guess I wasn't quite as bad as Tony Roper but I had no idea that I needed to take the role of Doug and actually coach and mentor my people. I just thought it was a matter of, you know, those guys are going to have the same work ethic as me. They'll, you know, uh, and and to some extent, I was a I was a bit of a Tony Roper. You know, I pushed my people to make their numbers. And fortunately, the general manager that had promoted me into that role saw how I was struggling, and he became my Doug. So I had the experience on both sides there. And, you know, that was a, you know, there's a story I can tell that, you know, he took me under his wing and he started to explain to me that my role wasn't to, to make the number. My role was to help develop my people so they could make the number and they could want to make the number. And that was, that was such a great lesson for me right at the start. So he helped me move from being a bit of a roper to being a Doug, and that stuck with me for four decades. You know, I've been you know, that's how long I've been in in sales, business management, and consulting, and uh, and it stuck with me. And I think we've all encountered people like that. I've been very fortunate, Pat. I've had in my career four Dougs, and um, each one of them has had a different impact on me, but each one of them. Even through, well, even now, I've still got a mentor at my age. Um, each of them has helped me develop in different ways. And I think one of the things that we need to do as salespeople, um, we need to continue that learning and we need to continue to look for the people that will help us. Any salesperson or sales manager that thinks they know it all really doesn't know anything because what you need to know is that you don't know it all. And you need to continue to develop, especially as new technology comes in. Um, that's one of the things that we talk about in the book is, you know, Sue goes in there and, and while the, while the organisation is looking, and I'm not giving anything away here, while they're looking for a security solution, Sue actually understands that there's much more can be done with a security solution with the technology that's available to give them an even better business outcome. And that's what it's about. It's about delivering the best possible business outcome for an organisation, not just what they think they need when you first start working with them. And that's why it's so important to go through, as Sue does in this book, a really in-depth discovery process. And in fact, if you've read the book, Pat, you'll, you'll know that it's very the thorough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, about half the book talks about discovery and disruption. And, um, and that's important. You know, if you don't go through that process, you're not going to really be able to, to position yourself to deliver the best solution and therefore the best outcome to the organization. I loved it. Well, like you said, you've, you've been very lucky. You've had four Dougs in your life. Yeah. I think this is an opportunity for the listeners and hopefully soon the readers for you to be a Doug for them too, through this book, the Winter yeah. prospect. Thank um, you. And, and, and one of the things you would have noticed in the book is you know, we, we struggled with the idea of it's great to put this story together, but how do we back it up? How do we actually provide people who want to dig a little bit deeper into the book or, or into what we're talking about there and give them an understanding of it? And we we fought with the idea of, of inserting a back section. We thought with the idea of putting a, a, you know, a second book together with just that technical component of it. And in the end, as you would have seen as you went through the book, Pat, is um, we linked it to an external website through a QR code, the strategic yeah. points through the book, where you know there will be a certain section that will go through, and then to learn more about how Sue, for example, went through the discovery section, they can then open that into a website, and that will walk them through the steps that they can understand. So what they've then got is they do have the process, they do have that, if you like, that step by step. But the step-by-step -step is woven into the story so that they understand that that step-by-step -step can be in multiple directions as it moves forward. So it's not just linear. It can divert all around that linear line depending on the individuals you're talking to. So we've really, I think we've done a pretty good job of combining the two there so that, you know, people can get go through the book, then they can come back and they can then study, um, you know, the process and the methodology that's been used. 
And, you know, we've got a, a, a uh, what we call authentic selling program, which we've put behind it, which, as you said, if people want to you know, further engage with us on that, well, we're more than happy to chat to them about it. Yeah. So so people, well, let's just keep, keep going on that. If people wanted to connect with you, what's the best way of doing that? Uh, look, I think LinkedIn these days is uh, is without doubt the best. My, my you know, Wayne Maloney, and that's uh, M-O-L-O-N-E-Y. Um, we've got the advanced.sale website, which has got all the uh, detail about the book and the process. And my personal website is waynemaloney.com. So anyone wants to reach out, I'm more than happy to connect. I, uh, I, I'm a little bit selective. I, I don't accept uh, generic, hey, I was just browsing through LinkedIn and your name popped up. Thought we should be connecting, you know, the, the, the ones that are canned. Uh, oh, our listeners won't do that. They're going to say, Wayne, I was listening to Sales Babble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's all Yeah, that's all I want is someone to take when they, they want to connect, just show that they do want to connect. And there's a, uh, um, and I'll make that effort and they can join in. And, uh, you know, we've, we've got a book club uh, where people can, uh, get on and once a month we get together um one of the authors jeff john or myself or maybe the two or three of us uh we'll get online and we'll discuss the book with people and uh you know we do that that's that that's a free service or service or not really a service but you know we, we don't have a charge for that people want to jump on we spend an hour a month just chatting about the book and that's a lot of fun uh, that really helps us understand where we could have improved the book um but it also to be quite honest with you, it, it gives us an opportunity to reflect on the success that we've had with the book. And that makes us feel pretty good, as you could imagine. I love it. I love it. Um, the book, what's the best way for people to find the book? Mate, I think wherever you, it's available uh, through Goodreads, but I think these days Amazon tends to be the, uh, the place where most people go. And um, if they just get on there and they, uh, they look for the Wentworth prospect, um, They'll find it, and it's available as a print book. It's available as an ebook, and it's also available as an audio book, which, uh, as you'd appreciate, is pretty popular these days. Oh, really? It's an audio book too. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. That's fun. Wayne, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for visiting the podcast. I, I haven't had a guest on the podcast for a while, but I was more than happy to break the rule. <laughs> to have wow. you on this is such a terrific book i can't speak high, more highly enough about well, it well that's that 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 you've made my friday pat that's fabulous <laughs> I, uh, I can go through the rest of the friday and whatever they throw at me i'm not really going to worry about it now i'll just reflect on uh, on that comment about the book oh it's it's great it's up there with the wolf on wall street the boiler room glenn gary glenn rots all those all, all my favorite all my favorites wow that's uh that's pretty high praise, mate. Thank you so much. I can't wait to pass that back on to, uh, on to Jeff and John. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. No, thank you, Pat. Really, really enjoyed it and appreciate your time. Folks, I highly recommend that you go to the show notes and get a copy of this book. If you're like me and you love books like Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, The Wolf on Wall Street, Boiler Room, all of these business movies that, that we're constantly repeating dialogue from. If you are into that kind of thing, you will love this book. Plus, if you're a B2B sales, you're going to learn quite a bit also. Like I said, it's all about politics and ego, petty, petty behavior, but also the courage for some people and some employees to step up and to do the right thing for the organization. To connect with Wayne, you can find links to him in the show notes at www.salesbabble.com. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with one person, one friend who is looking to grow their selling skills. If you got any questions or comments about selling, don't hesitate to reach out to me. I know a lot about this topic. I've been doing it for decades. <laughs> so... If you're in a pickle in some kind of predicament, I just might be able to help you out. Until next week and the next Dow to Ching of Sales, take care and have a highly productive and a profitable selling day. Thank you for listening to the Sales Babble Podcast. 
Find us at www.salesbabble.com. This is a production of Abenero Media.